Professor Nick Frost, who is our Professor of Social Work here at Leeds Beckett University. Nick has over 30 years experience, initially as a practicing social worker when he worked here in the city of Leeds and subsequently working in higher education, where he has developed a national reputation for his ex expertise and knowledge around, in particular, child safeguarding policy and practice. In addition to his extensive research, Nick has acted as advisor to national government and many local government organisations and is sought after for his input. He's rarely in the office, he's always out and about <laughs> meeting people who want to draw on his expertise. I know we've got people here that he uh, works with and for currently from in, in, within the region, so welcome. He currently is the ind independent chair of the North Yorkshire Children's Safeguarding Board and was formerly chair of the Bradford Safeguarding Board in the region, where he has been involved in serious case reviews and a warm welcome to colleagues from those two organisations in particular. Nick's work has, of course, uh, broad relevance, and that's why the audience here <coughs> comprises uh, a real diversity of people. I was looking down the, the, the delegate list, so to speak. We've got people from NHS acute and primary care services, local government children's services is probably the majority of you, children's centres, probation and justice services, private nurseries, advocacy organisations and some academic colleagues as well. Nick's lecture is going to reflect on the role of serious case reviews, which is the major technique utilised in England to learn from child deaths and other serious incidents. Nick will share his experiences with us all of his involvement of being at the heart of some reviews and which at times he's found himself under the scrutiny of the national media. And he will provide us with some observations for the future conduct of such reviews. It's a real pleasure to introduce Professor Nick Frost. Uh, thank you, Chris. Can I just check volume at the back? Is that okay? Yeah, lovely. It's really nice to see so many people here on a, a, a wet Wednesday. I was on leave till yesterday, so I don't even really know which day of the week it is. Um, and we, we will finish by 7 o'clock, because I know with evening events, people often have things to go on to. Uh, it's real, there's people here I did work with, with in Leeds, and people I've worked with since then in, in Wakefield, in Bradford, in North Yorkshire, and in other organisations. So I'm wanting to reflect on serious case reviews and there are some personal reflections that Chris uh, alluded to, uh, some political reflections which I more or less start with and then the professional implications of those. Um, we should have said it, who's here from our, can we send a PowerPoint out to people if they register? Yeah, yeah, okay we'll, say, we'll send the PowerPoint out. Um, so I'll combine these personal, political and professional reflections and I was saying to some people earlier I could probably speak to any one slide for an hour so I'll just have to be disciplined and move through so probably won't do any of them uh, justice so apologies for that. If you want to follow anything up there's my email address uh, there. Um, I was hoping Paul Hill wouldn't be here, but he is, and he'll know that that slide is a summary of some very complex guidance from the government. But I, I didn't want to get stuck in guidance that you can read uh, elsewhere. But basically, a serious case review follows a death or a, a, another serious incident, the criteria is that abuse and, and or neglect is suspected, and that multi-agency learning could arise from the uh, serious case review. Again, this is oversimplified. It's decided by the chair, the independent chair of the safeguarding board, with it following a recommendation from a panel whether you should have a review. And a new initiative, just about 14 months old, I think, is there, there is now a national panel set up by the government. And as a chair, you write to the national panel with your decision whether or not to have a serious case review, and they have some uh, input. I've called it discussed there. It's not yet tested. If if uh, I think it's still the decision of the independent chair with advice from the national panel. It's basically produced by an independent author. Again, that's an uh, oversimplification, but it means it's two steps away from the safeguarding board. The independent chair commissions it, and it's written by an independent author. And it's generally published in full, which again is a fairly recent development, again I'll talk about, after legal process has been completed perhaps uh, uh, the, the court process or uh, the coroner's uh, responsibilities. 
I didn't want to get stuck on that because I think there's more interesting things to talk about. I'm not going to stick to serious case reviews in the narrow sense, but perhaps more in the perhaps in the public sense. There's also other reviews. Uh, there's a, if you like, a step down from a serious case review, often called a learning the lessons review, which many people in the room will have been involved in. They tend not to be published, so they perhaps don't meet the criteria on the first slide, but there is still some lessons to be learned from them. And people tend to include uh, in discussions about serious case reviews things that actually are not serious case reviews, but public enquiries. Uh, I have a fault with my new generation of students of saying things like, you'll all remember Cleveland, and of course, <laughs> some of them weren't even born at the time of Cleveland, but going back to the late 1980s, the, the Cleveland uh, Review, chaired and written by Justice Butler Sloss. And then I, di I did want to mention, again, not strictly a serious case review, uh, recent events in Rotherham. So I'm not st sticking to the narrow sense of serious case reviews, to a, but to a broader sense. So that's the context. So I'll try and share these reflections. I want to reflect on the aftermath of a serious case review that I was involved in and other people in the room, uh, the sad death of Hamza Khan. Um, then to critically reflect on all that, on the politics, the, the personal aspects and the professional impacts in order to, to suggest uh, positive alternatives for the future. So that, that's the background. Moving on to more, hopefully more interesting material. And I have um, tried to be thought provoking. I genuinely believe the things I'm going to say, but some of it is controversial. Uh, I'm going to be very critical of some contemporary politicians, which can be a bit risky as I've found out, and then um, suggest some ways forward that are clearer than uh, I think their suggestions. So uh, a great friend of mine, um, <laughs> Michael Gove, who was Secretary of State for Education with Responsibility for Children and Child Welfare until recently. And a quote from him, I want to talk about child protection, specifically how we care about the most vulnerable children, those at risk of neglect or abuse, those who come into the care of others because their families cannot care for them. And I want to begin with an admission. The state is currently failing in its duty to keep our children safe. So the, the core of my argument is that there's a narrative that develops there around those words uh, failure linked to the state and state employees, many of you are in, in the room, uh, and linking with the the dialogue that we are letting children down. So this is a very significant quote, um, I think, in the, in the politics of, uh, of child welfare. Edward Simpson was Michael Gove's, if you like, deputy, the uh, Minister of State responsible for children specifically, and he's still in that role. And a similar quote, in a way, from him, one of the most critical vehicles for learning lessons, good and bad, are serious case reviews, Yet until recently, all that was published were bland executive summaries. Certainly it's true that executive summaries were published, whether they were, they were bland is a matter of opinion. This certainly suited the adults who had made mistakes. But the price of sparing their blushes was paid by our most vulnerable children who were condemned to suffer from the same failings over and over again because we don't learn vital lessons. So I disagree with just about everything uh, in this quote. Um, the, the, the idea that this suited the adults who had made the mistakes, so um, serious case reviews, for example, are commissioned by safeguarding boards, um, and then the, it's a, a considerable task, one I haven't got time to describe today, uh, and then they are published by safeguarding boards. So this idea of, of covering mistakes, I think, is, is wrong. Um, and also the, the idea that when a child has died, somehow he's put adults there, so it could mean parents. I think he means professionals. The idea that a child death is associated with a, an error or a mistake, I think, is deeply uh, problematic. And again, uh, I, I'll be talking uh, about that. So the idea that you're trying to cover your blushes in some way through this process, or that we don't learn um, from the same fa failings over and over again. So I, I would challenge just about every 
uh, element of that particular quote. So the more analytical part of what I'm going to say is this really, that we've created a poisonous atmosphere around serious case reviews, remembering I'm using it in that, in that broadest sense. So we've seen that the, the role of politicians and the politics of child protection. A good friend and colleague of mine, Nigel Parton, is probably the world's leading authority uh, on that, various books he's written about that, about how politicians utilise uh, child deaths in particular uh, ways. And um, how that creates what I think is a poisonous atmosphere around practice. And I'm going to switch that argument on its head later on and argue uh, about the, foot, the case for high quality uh, practice that I see every day in the work that, that Chris mentioned uh, earlier. That takes us on to the obvious channel for that, which is the media. And again, it's something I've been involved in lots of uh, media interviews and contacts with, with the media. Um, and they've picked up this narrative of around childhood and around public sector uh, failure. So that's a dominant narrative uh, in, in the press coverage. The, the role of childhood and the press at the moment, I think, is absolutely fascinating. And my analysis of this is that we no longer depend on the newspaper coming through the door at eight o'clock in the morning to know what's happened in the world on the previous day. I, I remember that. I remember not knowing big events until that newspaper came through your door. Now, through 24-hour news, we know all the time what's happening. So the newspapers can no longer play that function. So they've looked, like it, they've looked for different functions. Um, the Daily Express seems very interested in the weather. That's uh, often the headline. Uh, the Daily Mail in our health. So they found different roles here. And here the Times newspaper has been highly significant because it's often led on two major child welfare issues, adoption and child sexual exploitation. And you could put a cogent argument that they have actually changed national policy on, in those two areas, adoption and child sexual exploitation. So the media have an interest in shifting their role from reporting yesterday's news to being shapers of uh, public opinion. It was seen in uh, probably its sharpest sense in the Sun, uh, Sun campaign around Baby Peter, which led to the dismissal of Sharon Shoesmith, the then director of uh, children's services in, in Haringey. So the media here isn't a sideshow. It's a shaper of public opinion, of moral panic, of the way that we perceive uh, child protection. And again, I'm going to argue that that has been uh, deeply un unhelpful. So pu public opinion is, is shaped by the, the, pre the, the, two, previous, um, uh, power, the two previous points on, on that PowerPoint slide. That people associate child deaths with failure, with failure of the state, with errors by professionals. So you get a chain of association, which in my opinion, uh, becomes, um, becomes quite unhelpful. A phrase a lot of you will know from your uh, degree days, moral panic. So a moral panic is when, as a society, we have a deep concern about a particular issue. It may not be child welfare, it often is. It could be, uh, it's often to do with crime. It could even uh, be to do with the weather or, or something unrelated to, uh, to childhood. Um, but certainly there's been a series of moral panics around, uh, around child protection. You could argue there's almost a permanent uh, moral panic around child protection, which takes different formats uh, at different times. So our understanding of child uh, protection is socially constructed through this political and media narrative, rather than the reality of the everyday work, which, uh, looking around the room, most of you in the room are actually involved in. Uh, let me give an example um, that in doing the research for this. It turns out, although the statistics are collected in a slightly different way, just about as many children in this country die in car crashes as die in what you might call child abuse or child protection cases. Where's the moral panic? Where, where are the headlines? Where are the concerns about driving and about road safety and about 
uh, about how cars are designed. You occasionally, obviously, you get some coverage of that, but you don't get that front page banner headline, continuous news, looking for someone to blame every time a child tragically dies in, in a car crash. So that's why I think the social construction of child protection um, it is precisely that, it's a moral panic and, and a, uh, a social construction, rather than a reflection of our real concerns uh, about real children, because it is just as tragic when a child dies in a road traffic accident as it is when a child dies perhaps at the hands of their uh, parents. So that leaves us thinking about the significance of child protection and the significance of uh, deaths through deliberate acts by adults, normally uh, parents or perhaps uh, other carers. And I believe that that is socially constructed by this process that's briefly outlined here. So what's going on there? And I think we see it when, these, um, when we have these moral panics, and I've called it there, I suppose it's sort of Freudian concept, of transference. That the guilt that we all feel when children die gets transferred from any, some sort of collective responsibility and focused on individuals. So the, the, the prime example of that would be Sharon Shoesmith, who became the carrier of our collective guilt about tragic child deaths, where we can't understand it and we all say things like, how can it happen and how can people be so awful to children? And we need a carrier for that collective guilt. And the carrier at the moment tends to be the professionals, often not always social workers uh, involved in, in those cases. So all this adds up to a very poisonous atmosphere that, that I will argue later on is undermining good practice and I want to switch it on its head and argue for the good practice uh, around uh, this field for which there is evidence. Okay, um, just to share with you some of my uh, personal experiences here, uh, and other people in the room were involved in this. A, a tragic death of a, a little boy in Bradford that occurred um, whilst I was chair of Bradford Safeguarding Children Board, just, uh, but wasn't discovered, as you'll hear in the news clip, until some time uh, after that. And then I just want to share some of the personal experiences and how it relates to the politics there. And if someone can remind me, what am I clicking on the media player? Will that be the right one? Mm. Uh, oh, the, yeah, the one. Yeah. Okay, so this is um, a film taken by Sky News. I understand it was sh um, a, a live feed throughout most of the day on Sky News and on BBC 24 Hour News. So th this will give you the background for this awful case, and then I'll reflect on some of the statements in that. Didn't pass on any concerns about the children to social care. We didn't re make those referrals to state that we had any specific concerns about those children. It was just the way that we did business at that moment in time. And then we didn't go to see the children at that point because a trusted adult had spoken to them on our behalf. Hamza Khan was starved to death without anyone in authority noticing. Two years on, the authorities said, blame the system not us. If any of the workers did not follow the system, it's not the job of me, it's not the job of the serious case review, I am confident they would have been disciplined, but that's been looked into. The systems let people down, no one deviated uh, from, from a system. Hamza was found in a house littered with rotten food and rubbish in Bradford in 2011. His mummified body was so small it was dressed in clothes for a nine-month-old baby, even though he was four and a half when he died almost two years earlier. His mother, Amanda Hutton, was sentenced to 15 years in jail last month for his manslaughter and the neglect of his five young siblings. The publication of the serious case review into his death was undermined by government briefings that the report was rubbish and needed to be investigated. In a letter, the children's minister said he had deep concerns, demanded answers to 10 questions, and said each one was a missed opportunity. The trial of Hutton, seen here drunk when she was arrested, heard of a string of interventions by the police, 
social services and health workers. A serious case review revealed even more. Hamza's father, who has a conviction for assaulting Hutton, says the report is a whitewash. Whoever's actually done all this don't want to be accountable for all this. Someone's head's got roll for this. The defendant's here. It's all right saying we've got to learn from this. What are you going to do when there's the next child who's died in six months, a year, two years, five years' time? Believe me, it'll happen again. Hamza's father released this picture of his son's grave. If Hamza was ignored in life, there was no apology in the report. But after an hour of questioning, the head of social services said everyone there was sorry. Okay, that gives you some bit brief background to that particular case, probably uh, most of you will recall that. That was the 13th of November uh, last year and obviously Hamza had a short, sad and, and tragic uh, childhood. But reflecting more on the learning and the process and there's people in the room that were very much involved uh, in, in that case. Um, I will reflect just briefly on the, the personal aspect because it would be a falsehood to pretend uh, somehow that there wasn't uh, any personal impact there. Um, it's very, very strange. So, for example, my favourite newspaper, rather predictably, I know, is The Guardian. And uh, by, I was criticised by name in a Guardian editorial. So it's personal things like that that have quite an impact on you. Um, my favourite, just about my favourite radio uh, presenter is someone on Radio 5 called Sheila Fogarty. And I was interviewed by her and she was saying, this report is rubbish, isn't it, Professor Frost? So th these things do have a, a, a personal impact. Um, more seriously, um, I've probably got five or six what you might call poison pen uh, emails and uh, one that rather mysteriously found its way, a letter that found its way onto my desk and was hand delivered. My desk is literally the one at the end of a long corridor and one morning I came in perhaps three days after this and there was a handwritten envelope and inside was a lot of vitriol saying I was a racist child murderer, uh, which was very disturbing that it was delivered. We still don't know how it happened, actually, onto my desk. So it would be um, remiss of me not to say that there is a pers personal impact. There is a, a, a personal uh, impact there. And there's no doubt um, that the press were briefed by the Department for Education, as you heard, about the report being rubbish. Someone might want to ask me some questions about that later on. So th there definitely is a, a, a personal impact there. What matters more is the professional impact. And I played a specific role there with the professionals you saw at the beginning, which were basically the, the most senior police officer in the field in, in Bradford, the director of children's services, the most senior person in, in social care. There were some health people there as well who weren't in the video. And I wanted the safeguarding board to represent the partnership work in, in, in Bradford. So that's why I stood up, not for the whole conference, but for the part that you saw there, to represent the partnership and the strength of the partnership in Bradford and the good work that underpinned uh, a lot of the child welfare uh, in Bradford. So the professional impact really, really matters. And I was willing to act as a champion there for those professionals in Bradford because I have had, because I'm no longer chair, but still have every faith in their ability to safeguard and protect children uh, in Bradford. That doesn't mean, and this is always the difficult thing that you put in, and we were in that press conference, where you can say this will never happen again. Uh, and we deliberately didn't say that. We said that we, we will do all in our powers to minimise the chance of this ever happening again. So that really matters. Now, but there's an um, independent chair of every safeguarding board in the country. Uh, the chair of Leeds is someone called Jane Held, and she's also chair of Birmingham. And she was put in the opposite position to myself. So in Birmingham, again, you may remember, she said services in Birmingham are in inadequate and they are not protecting children 
uh, adequately. And if I am ever put in that position, I would say that as well. But I have every faith in the high quality services in Bradford that I was able to stand up there in good faith and represent those, uh, the partnership of those uh, agencies. So that will move me on to the quality of work across the field. I'm an independent academic, I don't need to say that. In, in a way you could argue academics make money out of critiquing. So you know, I've got no self-interest in saying that services are working really well and I'll try and convince you uh, of, that, uh, of that later on. The key, of course, is my main research interest is multi-professional working. And you saw that symbolised there uh, at the front table uh, in Bradford. And I'm going to argue later on that that is the key to child welfare uh, in this country. Um, talking about serious case reviews, there just aren't any funny stories, really. But I'm going to tell, this is the best I can do, I'll just tell the one uh, <laughs> vaguely amusing story. Some of you will have heard the, this before. My mum is really proud that I was on telly. So, um, regardless of the fact that Michael Gove said I was rubbish and the report was rubbish and all that, so she actually gave me an article from the Daily Mail and said, oh, look, look Nick, you're in the Daily Mail, and the headline was Minister Rubbish's Report, you know, but she was really proud. So, literally, on, on Christmas Day, she makes the whole family sit down and watch, video, watch videos of me being on TV, so, you know. News at 10, look north and all that. Um, and my, uh, I've got a lovely little nephew called Sebastian who was 10 at the time. And he was there with his dad, my, my brother. Um, and at, after all this video show, my brother turned to me and said, oh, come on, Nick, come clean. Uh, Hamza was let down by the social workers, wasn't he? And Sebastian, 10-year-old, chirped up. It wasn't, was he, Uncle Nick? It was the systems. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so we, we, we have it on good authority that this was a systems issue and not a personal, uh, a professional negligence issue. So as I say, there aren't many funny stories to do with ser serious case reviews, so that's the best I can do. Okay, so we've got the media interest, the political uh, interest. What I've argued is the social construction <coughs> around this issue rather than uh, genuine... Um, social facts, it's the way that they're constructed that matters. So that's the problem, that serious case reviews are socially constructed. So by that I mean I think that members of the public think that when there's a serious case review, this is the worst thing that's ever happened in child welfare and that it's a good way of learning. And I think it is neither of those things. They're not the worst cases. Um, I know of serious case reviews that have had no media publicity whatsoever, where there is very, very bad practice. Personally, I thought in Hamza Khan there wasn't any really bad practice. I thought there were cases where people could have pursued things further, but there was no example of really poor practice in that one uh, for me. Um, so th this social construction that somehow we need to learn from Baby Peter, Victoria Clumbay, Hamza Khan... Daniel Pelk or whatever, is purely that, is purely a social construction. And I, I did things wrong as a social worker. I'll give an example. I, wa I was once paying a very important visit and I went to 33 Beckett Mount instead of 33 Beckett Road. I got the wrong address and I, didn't, I couldn't do the visit till a couple of days later as a result. If a child had died as, as a result of that, that would have looked really appalling, negligent, inefficient, but, you know, nothing tragic happened as a, a, as a result. So there is nothing specific that we can learn from these tragedies, um, which we can't learn from other examples, or my next point, from good practice. And I would have thought the best learning may come from, um, from good practice, from, I know, hundreds of cases where there's been excellent practice, and a lot of you in the room will be involved in this, perhaps where a child's been neglected, it looks as if they might come into care, but the, together, health visitors, midwives, social workers, teachers, have worked together with the family to improve the parenting skills, improve the bonding between, between parents and child, and, and the, the family have been able to come off the, off the child protection plan. Why, why not learn from that? There is, of course, learning from that, but it tends not to get the headlines um, that the serious case reviews get. 
So what, what this moral panic around serious case reviews has managed to do is to create a negative atmosphere around what, what is largely a successful practice. Now, that seems counterintuitive. Um, if I went on Sky News and said the child protection system in this country is largely successful, it would probably seem a rather bizarre thing to do because this negative discourse is so dominant. But here's a few uh, facts to, to back that up. Uh, this is someone called Colin Pritchard and his colleague Richard Williams. Sorry, a bit of jargon in there. Um, what can be said with certainty? Over the period, period the previous period uh, before 2008, the rates of actual and possible child abuse related deaths um, have unequivocally declined in England and Wales and many, uh, and many modern developed countries, NDCs. Looking at the other result, results, most child protection system in the modern world have some cause for cautious satisfaction about the progress being made. So contrary to the Gove Timpson discourse, we have solid research evidence which suggests some success for the child protection system. Uh, equally from the NSPCC, the rate of child homicides has decreased by 29%. These are small figures, so I'm not sure they, that converting them into percentage is very helpful. But from 7.1 per million child homicides in 81 to 5 per million uh, in 2012-13. So the data is very complex. Um, th there's a report I've literally, I don't think it came out today, but I got it today, which backs this up and I, I'll read you uh, a quote from that, uh, from that later on. So my narrative here is one of success in a very, very difficult field. So let's take a difficult case here and reflect on it. Um, child sex exploitation, the Rotherham experience. We've had a moral panic around, uh, around Rotherham, probably one of the most dramatic uh, moral panics of uh, recent periods in terms of, of child welfare. And I want to put a counter narrative here, um, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of this uh, later on. This is a complex and challenging uh, social problem. And if there's a key word, if I wanted to repl replace the failure word in the dominant discourse, it would be the word with the word complex. And a lot of you in the room know better than I do. Every situation is complex. There is no such thing as a straightforward or a simple child protection case. They are all complex. What's the... Uh, Harry Ferguson um, writes about the complexity of the home visit, about the day-to-day -day detail of the home visit, about issues like where you sit, about whether you ask people to t uh, turn the TV off, if you, whether you ask a neighbour to leave. These are at leave. They're all complex decisions, and our workers are taking those. Probably on a home visit, you might take 80 or 100 of those decisions. Really complex, difficult, skilled uh, d decisions. And there is no more complex social problem, in my experience, than child sexual exploitation. A lot of you will know this, but just to give a few indicators... Uh, it's a hidden problem. It's hidden from the public gaze. It's not an obvious problem where you can walk the streets and see it, so that gives you a problem. It is the case that many victims do not see themselves as victims, so a real complex problem for our professionals. Oh, um, says 15-year-old girl, that 25-year-old guy is my boyfriend. I'm not involved in any child sex exploitation. How, how do you take that forward? How do you see that as an offence? How do you gather evidence around that? How can you involve the police and the courts in that? These are real complex uh, social problems. Um, we're living through a period of painful recognition, and you, oh, and I've got a typo in there, sorry. And living through a shifting paradigm. What do I mean by that? And this is embarrassing, but I'll say what I think is the truth. If I'd been given this lecture, in, say, 2003, on child sex exploitation, do you know what it would have been called? It would have been called child prostitution in England today. And that's embarrassing to say that now, but it's absolutely true. And I probably would have spoke about young women who were getting rewards from it, who were getting money and jewellery and phones and holidays. Um, and the reason that's now embarrassing is because there's been a paradigm shift. 
And I did do some basic Googling on this, and it's true in the Working Together guidance as well. Around the period 2003 to 2006, the child prostitution phrase disappears and is replaced by child sexual exploitation. So uh, we've lived through a paradigm shift, and that's why I'm very critical of the Rotherham uh, report, the J report, because it doesn't recognise that paradigm shift. There is no recognition that we were all living in that era where we were talking about child prostitution, where it was difficult to talk about the ethnicity of perpetrators and where we were talking about boyfriends and girlfriends. We were all in that space, say, in 2000, uh, for, for, for example. So the professionals in this field, for me, uh, to use a phrase from Linda Gordon, she's talking about... Um, service users in America in the 1880s, she calls them heroes of their own lives. And I want to turn the failure uh, narrative into the opposite and talk about professionals as heroes of their own lives. And I've been weighing up, whilst I've been lying on a sunbed in Tenerife, uh, <laughs> whether I should name people in the room, but I'm, on balance I'm not going to. But you know who you are. There's, there's people in the room who run safeguarding children boards, who work every hour, who work weekends. I get emails all the time saying, oh, here's something I wrote at the weekend. Uh, you know, emails, I got one today actually. I noticed it was timed at uh, 0036. So someone is sending an email at, at you know, half past 12 in, 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 in the middle of the night. Um, there's people in this room who've been, who I was a frontline social worker in 1979 and there's at least one person in this room who's still a frontline social worker in Leeds over that whole period. These people are heroes of the system. They're not people to be denigrated and to be associated uh, with, with failure. So we've lived through a shift in paradigm and the people working in this field should be recognised for what they've achieved. So what's happening in CSE, Child Sexual Exploitation, are really creative multi-agency responses. Um, We've had conferences, people, Julie there and uh, Jane sat at the back, have organised groundbreaking conferences. I had a paradigm shift at one that Julie was involved in, um, involving the licensing authorities in child sexual exploitation. It was something I hadn't really thought through. But now, all over the country, the licensing authorities are being used to uh, warn off um, public houses, warn off hotels, train taxi drivers, make sure there's good practice at hotel receptions, all sites of child sex exploitation. And through creative um, partnership working, that, that problem has been challenged in a way that, with all uh, respect, the Sky journalists on that video c could never do. So we're talking about creative multi-agency responses, utilising a wide range of methods. And I'm perhaps slightly over-egging the optimism here. But I think we have a real chance of beating child sexual exploitation through the partnership work with the courts, the police and crime commissioners, the police, social care, the voluntary sector that's absolutely key, health professionals. The only way of tackling this problem is through effective multidisciplinary working. No single agency can do it. But boy, is it a complex uh, problem. Um, I, th I actually thought I'd seen the worst of humankind when I worked with a dad who fractured the arm of his three-month-old baby. But these perpetrators are on a different scale to that. You're talking about uh, men that have, uh, uh, have raped 30, 40 young women and sometimes young boys who've then threatened them with threatened the siblings with violence in case uh, they're, they're covered out. The, this is a really complex and demanding social problem. But by working together we can reach a position of challenge in it. And it's not helped, and this is my slightly... I, I haven't found anyone who really agrees with me on this, but I'll, I'll give it a go. I, I really don't agree with the disciplinary procedures in Rotherham. I've read that report. I cannot see a disciplinary offence in that report. And I'm not soft on this. I think if people have lied, if people have been drunk on duty, if people have made up visits, they should be sacked, full stop. But I do not see a disciplinary offence in, in the Rotherham uh, report and there's a lesson to be learnt because I actually would have thought that one res resignation would give the media what they wanted and that actually that didn't happen in Rotherham as soon as you got one resignation you then got a domino effect 
And how does that protect the children uh, uh, of Rotherham? Uh, I'll tell you now what the Ofsted report will say when it comes out in a few weeks. Lack of effective leadership. Oh, what a surprise. The chief exec, the leader of the council, the director of children's services have all been forced to resign. How does that make life better for children? I, I just do not understand. So a little bit of a left field take on the J report. I think uh, it's not very helpful at all. I'll give one more concrete example. Um, there was a project established in Rotherham to deal with child sex exploitation that was a trailblazer, that was before many other authorities did it. It's mentioned in the J report, but what's not mentioned, those, re those projects don't fall out uh, of, of mid-air. Someone does the planning, someone does the research, someone finds the funding, someone appoints the staff, someone finds the premises. That's not mentioned in the Rotherham report. So I believe there must have been a, a group of people in Rotherham who were aware of CSE, who, who were working hard to combat CSE, not mentioned in, in, in the J report. So a slightly left field take on, uh, on that report. And actually, um, in a way, there was a, an argument last night that substantiated that because Middlesbrough produced a similar report. Uh, my guess is that many towns and cities uh, in England could produce similar reports. So there was nothing particular about Rotherham apart from the fact that they uh, commissioned and published this, uh, this report. So the heroes of their own lives, what do they look like? As some of you will have heard, um, heard me use this quote before, and I use this with the students and say, you could be this social worker. So it, it's a, a young woman I interviewed who's now a chief executive of a, a voluntary organisation and I was asking her about experiences in care and this was her recollection. My social worker was amazing and came to my graduation. He hunted me down when I tried to disappear. He came with me to my interview at uni and when they said I didn't have enough points, he asked if he could have a word. I don't know what he said but I got into uni then. <laughs> I'm still in contact with him now. He went the extra mile. Hero of his own life. I don't know who he is, but loads of you in this room are the same. If you're a health visitor, a midwife, a, a member of the police. The, the, um, the, the police officer, she was a community support officer, Jodie Dunsmore, who actually more or less worked out what had hap happened with Hamza Khan, whether other people hadn't done that. Absolute hero. Um, so why aren't we celebrating uh, the, the, these people in the way that Claire, Claire is here? Example from social work, but you'll know your own examples uh, from elsewhere. So the social worker becomes vilified uh, through the serious case review, through this uh, moral panic, through the political and journalistic discourse, and then that leads to this negative view when you, know, you can come up with positive data like this. I'm not saying there aren't problems, of course there are, but why do we emphasise that negative rather than celebrating the positive? So what would be more concrete in uh, taking this forward? Um, I've already spoken. I don't think the, the resignation and disciplinary line is a very helpful one, aside from the cases where, as I said before, if someone had committed a clear disciplinary offence, obviously they should be disciplined. But by taking a difficult uh, decision in a complex environment, to me that's not a disciplinary offence. So let's move beyond that. That will damage learning. Uh, there's already things going on around serious case reviews and other sorts of complaints procedures where I think it's going to escalate into barristers being involved and the rest of it like we used to have in the old days of public inquiries. So my suggestion would actually be that the serious case reviews become very harmful because of this <coughs> negative discourse. We could replace it by learning the lessons reviews, which tend to be um, more low-key, tend to involve learning and sharing. There would be multi-agency. You would share all the information. I think it's correct that they will be independently chaired. There's people that do this, consultants and pri uh, small private enterprises. So it would have an independent element. So all that uh, Gov and, and Timpson stuff about cover-up and, and sparing their blushes would not apply. They could then, then be submitted to government. Their key word is transparency. So it's totally transparent. You send it through to government. And then 
what I think would be helpful would be an annual report of the learning produced through the learning le lessons review. So every year you will get a report saying, you know, the, the lessons we've learned from undertaking these reviews. It will get rid of the negative discourse, it will get rid of the negative pub line, uh, headlines, uh, yet it would also produce um, a, a positive learning experience. So that, that could be a more positive way than the um, serious case review. So to summarise, um, we need to compact the, the discourse of failure and I want now to become an unashamed champion of the good practice I see. I work with the people in this room all the time and most of the time I see people, as I've said, working hard, working in the most complex field. Let's start to celebrate that instead of having this uh, discourse of failure. Let's recognise uh, success. We need to be better with the media. We have done it on a small scale locally in the safeguarding boards that I work with, but it's a, a, an uphill battle. But they will come and visit projects. They will do positive interviews. So let's try and recognise that success. And let's have proportionate responses. So why aren't we worried about the children that are dying in, in, in car crashes? Why aren't we worried about the uh, children that are dying in, in tragic... There, there was a case the other day that I thought was particularly tragic in Nigeria where a minibus full of young women was coming back from church and it crashed and they all died. There was about 15 young women. That was I did hear that on the news, but I've never heard about that again. What, why is that less tragic than one child dying uh, in, in England? So we need proportionate responses to these awful child deaths, but it's not helped by ignoring the research data that we saw, for example, from Pritchard uh, and Williams. Um, so what that will be about will be generating collective public ownership for these problems, <coughs> that we're not going to project it onto problems. It's a bit of a cliche, but safeguarding is everyone's business. So if you're a neighbour, if you're a teacher, if you're a friend, then you have some uh, ownership of that. Um, this sounds a bit grand, but developing a new form of, of British childhood where children are valued. Um, and I can't think of another funny story which is a bit self-deprecating, but for some weird reason I was reading a, a, a review of a holiday cottage in the Independent on Sunday and it said, oh, it's a wonderful cottage in the Kent countryside. And at, at the end it told you how much it was and it honestly said, children and dogs welcome. <laughs> and, and, uh, I'm sad enough that I did write to them and say uh, the problem with the British attitude to childhood is, is summed up in that sentence. So, <laughs> so, so w we need a more child-friendly... We come at the bottom of just about all the UNICEF League tables on childhood when it comes to things like bullying, child poverty, inequality, ill health. And we need to take collective ownership of that and trying to create a more positive form of British childhood where we feel a collective ownership and then... When we have success, we shall celebrate that collectively. And when we have a tragedy, we take shared responsibility for that. Thank you.